Please welcome to the stage, Lawrence O'Keefe! Hello. Hi, you all seem nice. Thank you. You having a good time? Thank you very good. Oh, you guys are wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I am going to read a little bit off this because I, I was just visited backstage by three old friends, my stage fright, my dyslexia, and my stutter. <laughs> so wish me luck. Um, <clears throat> I'm Larry. I have the best job in the world. I get to write musicals. But what I tend to write musicals is about a very cruel worlds full of carnage, like Heathers and Bat Boy, and the cruelest of all, Legally Blonde. <clears throat> I am very qualified to write about Cruel Worlds because I went to Horace Greeley High School in Chappaqua, New York, which is a foresty suburb where you are fucked if you have no car and no money. And, you know, uh, I had no car and no money. Um, it was, uh, I hear it's gotten better, but the Reagan years never really ended there. And later I was adapting Heathers for the stage and the original screenwriter, Dan Waters, a god, came to the workshop. He was incredibly generous. He was so nice. He was so supportive. And we started swapping high school stories. And in 10 minutes, he stopped me and said, Larry, Larry, I'm sorry. I think you went to a meaner school than me. And I wrote Heathers. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a lot of details, but imagine the worst thing that happened at your school. I guarantee you it happened when I was there. So now you're having a great feeling, aren't you? Um, all right. I noticed something recently. Not only do all of my shows tend to feature a misfit plunged into a cruel world, but in every one of my shows, the misfit gets a makeover. <laughs> it's true. Um, and, but, and then I was like, where did I learn this habit? Where did I learn this love of makeovers? And it is obvious from my childhood uh, watching John Hughes movies. <laughs> you have seen John Hughes movies. Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club. Yes, I'm hearing applause. <laughs> Pretty in Pink, Some Kind of Wonderful. Yes. Uh, they are wishful teen fable bullshit. They are not any more truthful than any other teen movie, but oh, those makeovers. Do you remember? <laughs> Do you remember Ali Sheedy, who's like the cranky Asperger's girl with the, with the, the dandruff? <laughs> and she gets a beautiful makeover from Molly Ringwald, the rich princess. And then so Ali Sheedy gets to kiss Emilio Estevez. A dream come true. And of course, Molly Ringwald herself in Pretty in Pink played the poor girl who got a makeover from her you know, friend Annie Potts and then she sewed her own prom dress and finally won the heart of Andrew McCarthy at the prom. So I took this to heart and for some reason my takeaway from this was competence can be taught. I was surrounded by all these people born into money and they just were effortless, but you know, not, effortful for, not effortless for me. My parents were pretty poor in a rich town. They never spent money on anything. No TV, almost no toys, no orthodontia, no car, and usually no shampoo. My dad would say things like, no one needs to wash their hair more than once a week. Stop wasting water. <laughs> My dad also invented the holiday festivus. You know that, the Seinfeld holiday festivus? Yeah, he, it's true, you can Google it. My brother wrote the Seinfeld episode about it. It's all true, and I'm not gonna talk about it tonight. <laughs> Much like when I was in high school, I would not talk about it when it was going on. <laughs> All right. But anyway, um, my loving, weird, and quite depressed parents were incompetent at teaching their kids any kind of life skills, like bathing, brushing teeth, uh, dressing yourself, conversational skills. We were, by, you know, to the naked eye, we were losers. That's the definition. You go to high school, you see a person who looks like that, and they're a loser. And, but John Hughes says competence can be taught. And acquire skills, you will acquire love, right? So I was like, fuck it, I'm not gonna stick around and be a loser. I'm gonna teach myself. I taught myself. I mowed lawns, I saved money, I bought shampoo, I learned to cut my own hair, something I apparently have forgotten how to do. Um, <laughs> but, and if mom will not pay for acne medication, I will use cotton swabs and vodka. <laughs> we had vodka. Um, a lot of trial and error. My freshman year, I was exactly like Anthony Michael Hall in Sixteen Candles, a repugnant nerd. I would flee me. Sophomore year, I was getting better. I was ducky and pretty and pink. Yeah, I had blazers with the sleeves rolled up and hats. Oh, God. And I'm playing Billy Joel on theater department pianos. Uh, junior year, I was, you know, still trying to improve. I was preppy. I was almost, almost achieved Cameron in... Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Remember that guy, Alan Rock? Remember him? He was like the, the, the nerdy wet blanket guy with a cold. He's like, I want my daughter. That guy. I loved him. It was great. Again, not 
cool yet, but getting there. But senior year is sweet if you are a theater kid, right? Because it's small pond, medium frog, and I'm aiming for Andrew McCarthy in Pretty in Pink. I'm falling short, of course, but I feel like now I have reached the final 10 minutes of my own John Hughes movie, right? Loser blossoms, finds the love of his life, roll credits. I'm ready. Okay, so first day of senior year at auditions for the school play, I meet, let us call her, uh, Jamie Summers. Let's just call her that. Uh, a junior transfer student, an IBM family, a gorgeous tall blonde, cotton candy hair, utterly luminescent, and she looked exactly like Galadriel, Queen of the Elves. And it is fitting because, of course, the elves had to leave, and the world is not made for elves anymore. And to be clear, she was, throughout all this, the warmest and kindest person. She never had a bad word for anyone. She was cheerful and kind, and she tried to see the best in everybody. Therefore, at this school, she was utterly fucking doomed. And I tried to make her laugh. I go up to her, and hey, what's your name? Make her laugh, and it works. And uh, whatever it was I said, she laughed really hard and she said, oh, thank you so much. Uh, I needed that, I've been crying all day. High school. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, within a week, by the way, her nickname was Miss Nebraska because at her old school, she had been a majorette and had twirled baton. At our school, there were no batons. Only cruelty. Anyway, um, <laughs> Jamie had never met me, though, as a gross, unwashed nerd. She met me looking preppy with my on-point hair and my cardigan sweater. <laughs> and so we hung out. Two weeks later, we kiss. We are dating. I tell people she's my girlfriend. I am on, I am walking on the fucking sun. Two weeks after that, I tell her I love you. A week later, she dumps me. She calls me and says, Larry, look. Oliver and Drew drove me to the Def Leppard concert. And I realized I am brand new in town. I want to make friends. At my old school, nobody went steady. So I don't want to be seen as someone's possession. Now, if you're, you know, today, if you're woke, you're like, well, of course, Jesus Christ. But this was, you know, this is like the 50s um, in our school. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, the tears are coming down out of my nose. And I'm like, is this because I don't have a car and Drew does? And she says, of course not. It was Oliver's car. <laughs> it's true. And that night I cried a, a lot. I was like, what the fuck? I thought Jamie was my reward. She was the end of my John Hughes movie. She was my last 10 minutes, right? How long is this fucking movie going to be, John Hughes? <laughs> so, went to school. We talked. Very civilized. Bell rang. Time to go. And I don't know what happened to me. I don't know what possessed me. I say, Jamie, may I have one last kiss goodbye? She's like, sure. We leaned in, and I did it perfectly. Two seconds, super innocent, no tongue. And as we kissed, I did not say a word out loud, but inwardly, silently, I put a curse on her. <laughs> now, it's a very benign curse. It was a very benign curse. And I, it, was, it just was this. It was just this. Let her not be happy with anyone else besides me. <laughs> Oh, come on, you've cursed people much worse than that. <laughs> yes, right? See, yes, it's true, okay. But, okay, so into the friend zone we go, right? Next few months, we would hang, she'd tell me how her dates went with Peter, or Drew, or, or Jody, or John, or Terry, et cetera, et cetera. But her dates just fizzled, and then they, they dried up, and she couldn't even make friends. She started looking different, and her skin went a little gray, and her hair went limp, and the cotton candy just went, mm, and she wasn't really eating. And I stayed supportive, I never criticized. I was whipped. I was in love with her still. I would never criticize, I never complained about anything because she was spending more and more time with me. Uh, she started saying things like, I can't make friends. You are my only friend. So Christmas rolls around, I get into a good college, I take my savings and I have guilted my parents into matching me and I get a car. <clears throat> it is a Chevy Citation. <laughs> um, but it's a car, and after Christmas dinner, I drive to her house, we trade presents in her bedroom, we give each other back massages, and we, you know, like that, we inch closer and closer, and we are kissing. We are making out again. After two and a half months of my broken heart, we are kissing again. Curses work. <laughs> they do. The next day, we're watching TV, and we start rounding the bases really fast. I mean, and I, believe me, again, because I'm terrified of doing something wrong, I am not pushing things. 
she is. I'm like, all righty then, John Hughes. But then she pulls back and she says, hey, Larry, um, I am fine with this, but I need you, please, to not tell anyone we are dating. And I'm like, uh, why? She says, well, I have a list. I say, a list of what? She says, guys who I would like to date. I'm like, oh, how many guys? And she goes, oh, about 10 or 12, look. And I'm like, oh, I'm not on this list. She goes, well, of course not, you're you. Uh, that was rough, but then she rounded third, so <laughs> I wasn't complaining that much. Oh, and she updated her list every week, exactly like Casey Kasem's American Top 40. <laughs> so I am confused, right? But I did not ever push things. She always pushed things. So one day in January, I was her first. We did it. And she pushed, I did not. She's enjoying it. She's smiling. Her eyes are closed. I'm like, yeah, John Hughes movie now, please. Yes. Uh. And in the middle of it, she calls out my name. No, actually, she says Eric. Um, I didn't bother to correct her because you're 17, you're having sex with the love of your life. Larry, Eric, it's not that different, you know. Um, I'm not gonna quibble over a couple of consonants. Eric apparently, by the way, was her best friend from high school, so lucky him, um, from her previous school. So then she said, um, afterwards she said, Larry, okay, I'm fine with this, but you're still not telling people that we're dating, okay? Oh, by the way, about two weeks previously, she had begun talking about killing herself. And uh, she said, I had no friends, I have no skills, I have no future, I am in constant pain, Larry. And I'm like, wow, Jamie, we should call a therapist. She's like, no, no doctors. This is not a big deal, really. It runs in my family, uh, you know, the sadness, and some of my relatives have been institutionalized, but look, you, you can't tell anyone, though. If you tell anyone, they will take me away. You are my only hope. Um, that was my worst mistake, because Rather than challenging these assertions, I, you know, I was 17, I didn't know what, which way was up, so I really became a 17-year-old, unlicensed, unqualified psychotherapist and occasionally paramedic to a deeply depressed girl. A few times I restrained herself from throwing herself down a flight of stairs. Once I even stopped her drink from drinking drain cleaner, and this was before we ever saw Heather's. Um, this, so I had a secret I could not tell about a problem I knew I could not fix. Plus, every week, couple of weeks, she'd say, Larry, I just need a friend. We should stop sleeping together. And that broke my heart every time, but I never argued. When she said stop, I said okay. When she resumed, I said okay. The first time we stopped, I drove home from her house on the wind, like a windy, foresty road, passing a very big, huge tree on a dangerous curve where two years previously, a Horace Greeley student had plowed his car into it and died. And I passed that tree, and I realized, all I have to do is just drive straight. Just don't follow the road, stay on course, and the tree will take care of everything. I began to think about that tree a lot. But prom was coming up, everybody goes to prom, yep, so gotta go, and so there was a one day window to buy your tickets. If you weren't already in a serious relationship, that was the day everybody like negotiated. Uh, so I found Jamie in the computer center and I say, I get down on one knee, do not do that. <laughs> Do not do that for any, if you don't have a ring, do not get down on any, but I did. Jamie Summers, will you do me the honor of going to the prom with me? And she says, oh, um, maybe. I have to ask Oliver first. So I waited for two hours and she asked Oliver, and this is all true, Oliver said, maybe. I have to ask Natalie first. <laughs> Oliver asked Natalie and Natalie said, um, maybe. I have to ask Larry first. There you go. Um, but of course, uh, am I fucked up in the head? Yes, and, I, and I, I didn't notice that maybe other people actually were responding to skills and other people wanted it. No, I, w I had my mission, I had my calling, I had my job. And so I told Natalie, no thank you. Natalie said yes to Oliver, Oliver said no to Jamie, Jamie said yes to me. Param is on! So, <laughs> country club in Rye, New York, right across from Playland, all right? Tuxedos and gowns, Jamie has pulled her shit together and she's gorgeous once more. And everybody's nice to each other. Maybe it's end of the year, maybe a lot of us are seniors, whatever. We dance in a circle to Lean On Me by Club Nouveau. 
theater kids dancing to Club Nouveau. That is my happiest memory. And Jamie and I slow danced to Howard Jones' No One Is To Blame. The irony was lost on me. In front of everybody, Jamie looks me in the eyes for a long time, then she kisses me in front of everybody. And she says, Larry, you have saved my life a hundred times. I don't, I'll never know how to thank you. I love you. And we were married two years later. No, I'm lying, I'm lying. I lied. I lied. She did kiss me and she did say I love you in front of everybody, but then she said, I'm gonna go dance with Oliver. True story. She then danced with all top 12 of her list that week, in order. And I'm watching and the tears are running down my heart. And I notice she looks happy. She is meeting new people. She is making friends. I, so I drive her home, 4 a.m. She hugs me and she says, thank you so much for a great night. This would be a good way to go out. I think tomorrow I should be dead. And we argue. I was like, well, no. And I say, you should live. And she, she, you know, she won't really commit. Finally, it's 5 in the morning. I got to go home. So I leave and I'm driving home on the windy road. And the tree is coming up in a few minutes. So I start to press my foot on the gas, going faster and faster. And the bend with the tree is coming up. In about eight seconds, I have to make my decision to go with the road or stay on the path. With about three seconds left, I go, ah! And I hit the brakes really hard because right in the road is the biggest fucking turtle you have ever seen in your life. It is the world's biggest snapping turtle. If, this, if it had been a carry-on bag at the airport, they would have been like, no, you have to check it. That, it was that big. I didn't know they came that big. It is just standing there between me and the tree. It is slowly like chewing on, a, on like a twig. And I get out of the car and I look at him and he looks at me. And in that instant, I realized, well, there's my answer. Maybe I was willing to my kill, kill myself, but I had instinctively refused to bring another living creature with me. And then I instantly realized that for the last couple months, Jamie has been trying to do the same for me. So I realized in that instant, I have to undo the curse. So I'm like, dear God, and or turtle. <laughs> Uh, I want to make amends. I cursed the love of my life because I couldn't accept that I am not the love of hers. I thought I was her white knight, but actually I'm basically like a bellhop at a hotel who takes the luggage up without being asked and then stands in the room with a handout waiting for a tip. So I'm sorry, turtle god. Would you please undo the curse? Please make sure, please make sure Jamie lives to find happiness with somebody who is not me. And the turtle walks off the road. And he turns back with a look, and the look is clearly saying, now don't go cursing anyone, you hear? <laughs> All right, so the next day I called Jamie, I told her, you get a therapist or I will get you one. She did, and no one called her away. Graduation, summer, more drama here and there, but I was getting ready to go off to college, and she was getting ready to let me. And then, years later, I got to dance with her at her wedding to a fantastic guy. And we danced and we hugged her and I shook hands with her husband. And then he and I stood at the bar while she danced with 12 different guys. <laughs> each of whom had the same exact look on their face that I knew I had on mine. So clearly life is not a John Hughes movie. This one was clearly more French. <laughs> but we both survived it and we survived the cruelest school in America. She was the love of my life for one year and it did not kill either of us, and as happy endings go, I'll take it. Thank you very much.